So a couple of announcements, just uh, uh, two of them actually. Homework 2 is uh, uh, due in a week, next Tuesday. Uh, we've, we're just starting grading your homework 1, we should have it back to you as soon as it's done. Um, I hope you've taken a look at homework 2. Um, it, I have been told it's less work than homework 1, but uh, uh, that probably means nothing. <laughs> So, uh, has anyone started? Are there any questions? I know there's a lot of lively discussion. So, yeah. um, I just wasn't sure where to begin on the first question, where we're supposed to blow up the feature space. Right. Um, so, uh, in fact, I just uh, posted a note on Canvas about this. Oh, okay. um, quick hint. So, let's see. That's cool. So, Let's say you have some. Here's the thing. I worry that if I tell you too much, I'll give away the answer. The answer is so simple. So once you see the answer, you'll be like, really? That's what he's asking? Because it literally applies the definition of a linear classifier. And in fact, let me just um, write what I wrote in ca on campus. Remember, what's the definition of linear separability? Suppose your input, I'm going to use z's, not x's as inputs. And let's say z's are these vectors that look like this. z1, z2, z, n. So these are n-dimensional vectors. And suppose I claim that there, the input, the true function, is a linearly separable function in the space z. What I mean by that statement is that I can produce a weight vector w and a bias such that for some training set or let's say there is a true function f f which takes z to this is a horrible notation but f that takes these n dimensional vectors to oh, no. <laughs> you know what I'm just going to write it here so you have z which is z1 all the way to zn and the true function is f which takes these n dimensional vectors to minus 1 comma 1 okay and there is some function we maybe know what it is if i claim that this function is linearly separable then what i'm actually claiming is that there exists a w which also is n dimensional let's say w1 w2 all the way to wn and a bias which is a real number, <coughs> such that f of z is the sine of wi zi. So, all I have written is the definition of linear separability. Now, in question 1, I have given you a function in x. In particular, it is a function that takes x1, x2 to minus 1, 1. I have given you a function. <coughs> Clearly, that function, just if you look at it, is not linear. It involves powers of 4, I mean, fourth powers of the x. What I am asking you to do is to take this x1 and x2 and convert it to some z using a transformation phi such that in the space of z's, you can produce the w and v. So, I'm asking you actually for two things. One of them is this conversion function that takes the x's to some other space. And now, it is obviously the phi is a nonlinear function. Because you cannot, you know, take a linear function and approximate, a, not approximate, you can take a linear function and say that it's equal to a nonlinear function. So phi has to be a nonlinear transformation from the space of these two dimensional vectors to some other space, possibly n dimensional vectors. I'm, I'm deliberately not telling you more than that because if I give you any more, you'll know the answer. So phi is a transformation from this two dimensional space to a different space. And in that different space, once you apply the transformation to an input, if your inputs are just as these, you should be able to produce a w and a v. So your answer should consist of two parts. This phi and a proof that your transformation is correct in the form of a w and v. And one more hint for people who decided to wake up early and come here. Uh, 
the W and the B should <coughs> involve, one of them should involve that R that's in the question. Okay? I feel like I've given you enough to start with. I don't want to say more because uh, uh, then I'll just be doing your homework. Think about it and you know, you can, we can chat about it. Are there other questions about homework? Has anyone started? There was actually a good question about the mistake bound, uh, uh, what do you call that, the question in the, on the canvas and uh, I encourage you to read the discussion. Uh, maybe that will also force you to ask some questions on campus. Any questions about the homework? Um, so, the other thing, uh, mo almost everyone has uh, given, has submitted the details on the project, thanks for that. Uh, to my utter surprise, I found that only 15% of the class wants to do a competitive project. Um, not sure why, I was expecting a lot more. Uh, but you still have a chance of switching if you want, uh, no reason not to, but it's up to you. Um, just a bit more information about the competitive project. I've been talking to Professor Zwanimir Rakha Marek, uh, who does formal methods. And uh, I've really got my hands on this data set of Android malware. So, almost definitely this will be the application. Um, this will be the problem. There is a data set where every example is an app on the Android App Store. And the classification job is to predict whether uh, this app is malicious or not. This is actually from a research paper from a year or two back. Uh, you don't have to worry about features. They have, they have produced features, for, uh, they have feature extracted in the data set. Uh, and all you have to do is try out different algorithms. And uh, this is almost definitely the data set. I'll confirm this in a while, partly because I want to actually try out some algorithms on this data myself. All I have to go by are the data and the paper. I want to test out a few things myself before I confirm it. Uh, and you still have an option of switching. If you are switching, um, send us a message. Any questions? <coughs> Once again, if you have not started the homework, please start. It's, uh, it's easier, but not that much. <laughs> Alright, so if there are no questions, I'm going to get back to the lecture. Let's just say W transpose X. 
Sometimes you'll also see this written as sine of this is WT. This is another way of writing the dot product. <coughs> oh, this is going to be uh, this is going to take a pretty little minute. So I make a prediction. And then you are provided with the true answer, y. So the input is really x comma y. And if the prediction is not equal to y, then you make an update. The update is simply w, <coughs> w t plus 1 is w t plus some learning rate times the true label y times the input. That's it. This is the perceptron algorithm. This is the end of one round of the algorithm. You make a prediction, and if the prediction is wrong, you make an update, and the update just says, change the weight vector by adding the product of y and x to it. There is an, a learning rate r, which is just a small real number that you uh, fix at the beginning. Questions about the mechanics of the algorithm? Yes? Uh, so. The features, if um, they're binary, right. should false be zero or negative one? Because you know that, like your, that would have a big effect on this. It, it seems like it would, but actually it does not. Uh, because of the, the, the between zero and minus one, there's a linear transform. So pretend that you had a representation where false was minus one and true was plus one. I can let's say this was uh, the, the feature x i. Okay, I'm going to transform it. X i prime is say x i plus one divided by two. A minus one becomes a zero, and a plus one becomes a plus one. <coughs> so it's a, just a linear transformation. And uh, whatever, if you had a linear classifier in the original space, you have a linear classifier in the other space because it's just a linear transformation. And you know you can also the inverse transformation is also linear, so it really does not matter so much. Um, the con it's mostly a matter of convenience. Uh, in fact, in the homework question, uh, the, the the data set that you have falls to zero uh, because uh, zero having zeros is actually a convenient thing because what happens is if you can have a so let's say you have a sparse vector where most of the features are zero, then you don't have to you don't have to put them in the vector. As a you know, data structure, you can have just a map that only stores the non-zero values, and this has some useful um, it, it you know saves you some effort. So having zeros is often the standard. Thing. Other questions? So this is the perceptron algorithm. There are many variants of this, and you know we'll see a few of them. And we looked. The last thing we saw in the last lecture was uh, this uh, slide about the geometry of the update, and I'm going to start with this again. So remember that the linear classifier is just a hyperplane. It's just a plane, or in this case, in this picture, a line. And this line is completely defined by uh, a normal and uh, and an intercept. And here I'm going to show that the the intercept is uh, zero, so the normal. That's this vector, the arrow here. And let's say this is the weight before the round starts. A new example comes in, x, and it has a label plus one. Examples are also n-dimensional vectors, which are also points in n-dimensional space. Here, points in two-dimensional space. So I can write it as a vector. In some sense, what the perceptron algorithm is saying is, Positive examples, the vectors corresponding to positive examples, and the weight, the, the normal of the hyperplane should point in the same direction. Here, if you if you take the dot product of these two vectors, it's negative because this angle is more than 90 degrees, and uh, that means it's a mistake. Which means you need to update, and the update is w is w plus y x. Y is positive which means that you are using the standard vector addition rule you are adding this red vector to the blue vector the dotted thing to the w 
and this is your uh, usual vector addition rule and you get a new weight vector. So one way of thinking about it is the weight, the, the, the update on a positive, actually also on a negative, rotates the hyperplane so that the positives are on the correct side or the negatives are on the correct side. Let's go through this again. For a negative example, let's say this was the weight vector at the beginning. A new example comes in, it has a label minus 1. And uh, in this case, the dot product is positive, which means the, there's a mistake, which means we have to update. Once again, the update is the same. It is y times x, but this time y is minus 1, which means you add the opposite vector to the, the uh, input. And you apply the same process, you do the vector addition thing, and you rotate the weight vectors. Here, this is a cartoon example where the update is dramatic and the mistake is immediately corrected. More likely, the change would just maybe change it a little bit. It might still be a mistake, but maybe less of a mistake. And this is where we stopped in the last lecture, so I want you to uh, think about this and ask me any questions. <coughs> Ah, so in the proof that we'll in the theorem that we'll see, I'm going to assume that W naught is zero. Um, in practice, there are two ways of thinking, going about this. Most of the time, you'll we'll assume that the initial weights are zero, but if your if your data is linearly separable, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the choice of W naught will not matter. If your data is not linearly separable, then maybe it does. But uh, uh, in the proof, I'll assume that W0 is zero. The, just the zero. What about the bias? Zero. So, I mean, it's, it's got the same, everything I said about the weights applies to the bias because I can think of the bias as a weight. Other questions? Yes. Is it possible, because you said it's common to rerun the training algorithm on the same data over and over to try and continuously improve it. Yes. Is it possible that while doing that, it keeps, I mean, the number of mistakes doesn't go down for some reason, maybe there aren't enough examples or something? Or uh, this is a good way to start the lecture today because I will prove to you that if the data is linearly separable, you will stop making mistakes, or the algorithm will stop making mistakes. and I'm going to try to convince you that this is correct and at the same time point out that it's completely an unnatural thing to expect. So, fairly simple update and yet it has that problem. Is the data <coughs> linearly separable? Because either I'm doing no. something wrong no, or... No, no. <laughs> it's real data. Real data is not linearly separable. Okay. Uh, that's a, this uh, castles in the air thing that we built so that we can do theory. Okay, because I kept running it on the training data and the accuracy didn't improve. Yeah, you will plateau out or in some cases even go down on real data. Also? Yes. Do we update the bias also? Yes, most definitely. Remember, the bias is just another weight. The bi think of the bias as just another weight. Everything that applies for the weight vector, also the weights in the weight vector applies to the bias because remember the transformation we did by introducing a bias feature? By introducing this constant feature that uh, is basically a feature that's always one, <coughs> and the bias is simply a weight corresponding to that feature. Everything that applies to the weight applies to the bias. Uh, so, you said we started with all weights zero and bias zero. Sure. Yeah, in the theorem, yes. In the homework, I think I asked you to start with random weights. No, but uh, suppose we do that. Yeah. Then our equation is y uh, into w transpose x plus the bias. Yes. So if that is both are zero, then, then I never have a mistake, right? No, uh, that, that depends on ah, that depends on what's the sign of zero. Uh, you assume that the sign of zero is plus. The sign function SGN of x is defined as plus one if x greater than or equal to zero, minus one if. So the, and at this point, if uh, the first example is negative, you've made a mistake. Yes. And we check if a sign of the expression is strictly less than zero. If in that case, 
if the sign of the expression is less than zero, you're predicting as minus one. So I think the question that you're trying to ask is, instead of taking sign, I predict using, if I check for a mistake looking at the sign of y w transpose x. If this is negative, then you have to make an update. But at the beginning, this will never be negative because w is zero. So uh, just to... Right, right. So let me rephrase that question so that uh, we can agree on what the question is. Let's just to test if, we have, uh, if I understand you correctly. One way of writing down a mistake is if y not equal to y prime, where y prime is sine of w transpose x plus bias, but I'm going to ignore the bias, assume that the weights are there. Another way of writing the same thing I said in the last class is if y times w transpose x is less than zero, then update. Hmm. So let's consider this, y times w transpose x. Consider this expression less than zero. If your initial weights are all zero, it will never be less than zero, which means you will never update, which means your weights will never go away from zero, which means you will never update. That's the, is that your question? And I remember someone else also asked me the same question, and this is a very subtle point, which is why you need to check for less than equal to zero. That's it. That's pretty much the at which point the first example comes in, you're guaranteed that it's a mistake and you make an update and after that you'll never get stuck in this. But it might not have been a mistake. In it might have not have been a mistake. So you, you are kind of giving yourself an allowance the first time. Effectively what you're saying is that your starting mm -hmm. weights are not zero but the equal to the first example. Yes, wouldn't it be better if you take some weights and just leave it strict and for things there? Yeah, but you have, if you are thinking about it that way, you have to write general purpose code. Your code should not, uh, it, this is much easier to write and the, uh, the theorem still applies with this. Yes? I, I don't understand your comment when you're saying that your set is linearly separable, the bias doesn't matter. That no, it's not that the bias doesn't matter. Yeah. If the data is linearly separable in n dimensions and there is a bias feature, so if your example is x in, you know, I'm going to write x as this way, x1 through xn, your examples look like this, yeah. and it's linearly separable, I claim, what that means is, this is the, the, the linear, the, the, in, the score part of the thread sign, so I'm not going to write the thing outside, so it's just wi, xi plus the bias, there's a sign here, this is the definition. Right. This. And of course, change the bias matters here. But instead of this, I'm going to transform this into x prime, which by adding a constant feature and just keeping the rest of them. This is an n-dimensional vector. This is an n plus one-dimensional vector. Here, this is the same as and let's define w0 equals b. Right, I understand that. Yes. I just didn't understand why you... So, the, everything that applies for the weight applies for the bias, assuming this transformation. Because the bias is just another weight. Oh, you mean your initial choice doesn't matter? Yes. Okay, I'm yes. sorry. Yes, everything that applies for the weight applies for the bias. All right. Yes. What happens when we do an update? I mean, do we move the symmetry <coughs> line towards the actual point? No, you don't move the, you actually rotate, rotate you rotate the line. So this was the original line and you're rotating the line so that the point is closer to being classified. Yes? Uh, if we keep on updating all the time, will that be a possibility <coughs> that the previous points that were classified properly? Oh, most definitely. That can happen. In fact, there's nothing that says, there's nothing in the mechanics of the algorithm that prevents it from happening. And this is an online algorithm, which means after getting the first, after you know making an update on an example, you throw it away. You don't remember it and then go back and correct it because 
uh, example three, the update on example three ruined example two. No, you don't even have example two because you threw it away. So it's entirely possible, which is why uh, at this point I feel like uh, you guys are ready for the theorem, which is why uh, the the perceptron learnability theorem is an extremely non-obvious result. So before we get into the perceptron learnability uh, theorem, couple of things. Um, first of all, obviously the perceptron algorithm can't learn what it can't represent. Meaning functions that are not linearly separable cannot be learned using the perceptron algorithm. And uh, while this may be like an obvious statement, it created a bit of a, uh, a lot of press in the late 60s. Uh, because I, I mentioned before, uh, this is a book from 1969, a fantastic book, way ahead of its time. Um, uh, it basically said, it analyzed the perceptron algorithm from a geometric point of view and pointed out exactly the statement. Perceptron algorithm cannot learn functions that are not linearly separable. In particular, the classic bad boy example uh, of machine learning is the XOR function. The XOR function looks like this. You have some space, you have some pluses here, pluses here, minuses here, and minuses here. <coughs> not linearly separable, and the book pointed out that this function cannot be learned. And uh, it kind of made perceptrons a bit unfashionable for a while, and then they got away. What you need to know out of all this for now is you need to be able to, you need to understand the perceptron algorithm, in particular, what the update rule is. You need to be able to uh, uh, make you need to be able, you need to understand the geometry of this update. What's happening in the n-dimensional space? You're basically rotating these planes. <coughs> And you need to understand what functions the perceptron algorithm learns, namely linear functions. So it represents a linear classifier. So the hypothesis space for the perceptron algorithm is a linear classifier. So at this point, remember we spoke about mistake bound algorithms last, or maybe the last or the one of, last week, let's say. It turns out the perceptron algorithm is a mistake bound algorithm, and there is a fairly simple proof for this, and that's what I'm going to do now, unless there are any questions that, <coughs> yes? So if you can you know, misclassify the usually classified points, what about the convergence? Good question. Hold on to that thought and I'll prove it to you in the next 30 minutes. Yes? Uh, if you remove R, is the current example classified or? If I remove what? R, the so learning rate. Uh -huh. So is the current? Is it classified or does it slowly move? So you want to, basically you want to set R to 1. Yeah. Um, there is nothing that says that setting R to 1 will force the current example to be classified. In fact, uh, in, order to in order to force the current example to be correctly classified, you might have to set a, pick a very small learning rate or a very large learning rate. And in fact, this is... Uh, one of the questions for the grad students uh, in the homework. So if you read the notes, you, there's a derivation for choosing R so that at every point, it's called the aggressive perceptron. The aggressive update chooses the learning rate so that at any point the current example is correctly classified. <coughs> and it chooses the, and you will see the, the choice in the homework statement. It depends on the example, of course. The example shows up in the choice bar. Yes? So, if it can only learn linearly separable functions, I mean, do we still use it? On oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. it just sort of gives you a, a best guess. It, it's not a, I wouldn't call it best because best implies an objective thing, but it seems to work pretty well in practice. And by that, I mean not the vanilla perceptron that we just saw, but some of the variants that we'll see later, in particular the average perceptron, is uh, a very robust algorithm. Uh, the reason for this, actually it's a completely uh, non, it, it's not clear that uh, you know, if it's not a linear function, why should it work? One of the reasons, my guess is that we end up operating in these extremely high dimensional spaces. And in extremely high dimensional spaces with very few points, most concepts end up <coughs> being linearly separable or close to linearly separable. Um, this is... Uh, Something that you <coughs> may not appreciate if you don't, uh, if you haven't seen high dimensional spaces before, but uh, you know, that's just like. 
Let's move ahead. The, there are two theorems, and I'm going to state and prove one of them formally. One of them is called the convergence theorem. Simply says, if the data is linearly separable, if there exists a set of weights that can linearly that is consistent with the data, then the Poisson-Brown <coughs> algorithm will converge. It will find a set of weights that correctly classifies the data. The counterpoint to that is called the Poisson-Brown cycling theorem, uh, which says if the training data is not linearly separable, then the learning algorithm will enter an infinite loop. It will never converge. If the data is linearly separable, the algorithm will converge. If the data is not linearly separable, the algorithm will never converge. That's pretty much the statement. Um, I'm not going to talk about this theorem much. I just want you should know this. But uh, we're going to look at a formal statement of this theorem, the convergence theorem, and look at a proof. So, in order to talk about the convergence theorem, you're going to uh, we are going to look at this idea called margin. Margin is a really important concept that shows up not only in the perceptron algorithm, but uh, it's an idea that pretty much drives the idea of support vector machines. Uh, we will see this slide multiple times in the semester, and you need to understand this uh, at an intuitive level. And it's a fairly intuitive idea. So, given a, a data set like this, a labeled data set with the pluses and minuses, and a hyperplane, intuitively the margin of the hyperplane the margin of the data with respect to this hyperplane is simply the distance of this uh, closest point. This distance here is closer than all other distances and that's the margin of the <coughs> data set with respect to this hyperplane. The margin of an entire data set and the usual symbol for this is gamma. The margin of a data set is the maximum possible margin. So you Effectively, one way of thinking about it is you try out every possible hyperplane to separate the data and the maximum distance of the, uh, the hyperplane that is puts the maximum distance between itself and the data is the one that gives the maximum margin. So, for example, here you can, this hyperplane has some margin here, that's the red line that I drew. This one has a different margin. It's this line. This one has this margin. So every line, every hyperplane has a certain margin and the maximum one is the margin of the data. Yes. Is that restricting the hyperplanes that actually do separate the data? Yes. Okay. We are assuming that the, the data is separate uh, for now because uh, the margin is defined for that case. So I've written, uh, what I've written here is just a uh, or you know, what I've drawn here is just to a pictorial example of what the margin is. But I'm sure all of you know how to calculate the distance between a line or a hyperplane at a point. So if you are given a data set that looks like x1, y1, xn, yn, x's are vectors. I'm going to draw a line on top just to drive home the point. The margin of this data is simply so, and let's say you have a hyperplane that's defined by W. The margin of this uh, data with respect to W is simply the maximum distance of Xi comma W. Oh, sorry. Xi, you know, let's just, wow, 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 let's just write. Absolute value of W transpose Xi divided by norm of W. That's the distance of the line from the point. That's the margin of the data. But instead of thinking of, but if we assume that the data is linearly separable, what that means is consider points that are positive. If yi is plus 1, then the, the, we know that this is greater than 0. If yi is minus 1, we know this is less than 0. If we, if we assume that the data is linearly separable, then the product of yi and w transpose xi is positive. So I can mimic the absolute value by saying, and I'm going to continue this here at the bottom, this is simply the max over i, yi, and this is the 
formal definition of the margin of the data with respect to this hyperplane W. Okay? Now, what's the margin of the data in general? It's just simply the largest. Oh, there's a mistake. The closest. <coughs> I want to find the closest point. I want to find the closest point. This is the distance of the closest point to the data. This is a so this part here is the distance of a point xi from the line. And if I iterate over the entire data set, I get the closest point. That's the margin of the hyperplane. And if I try out every possible hyperplane, that gives me the margin of the data. Questions about this uh, definition? We will see the margin multiple times and you need to understand it both formally and intuitively. The intuitive definition is fairly simple. Find the hyperplane that best separates the data and the distance, the closest, the distance of the closest point to it is the margin. <coughs> is, it, is this a unique uh, solution? Yes. In fact, not only is it it's a unique solution up to scale of W, because if I multiply the weights by 2, I'm multiplying it to both the numerator and the denominator. So it's unique up to scale. If I assume only unit vectors, then it's a unique solution. In fact, we will be as if you assume, yeah, if in fact, we will be assuming unit vectors for the theorem that's coming up. So, are there questions about the margin? About the definition of the margin? W is the hyperplane? Yes, W is the weight that, this is the, W is the norm of the weights of the hyperplane. Is the, you know, the perpendicular direction. So, let's look at the mistake bound theorem. In order to kind of uh, scare you, I'm just going to throw the theorem on the slide first before proving it. Uh, or at least step through it a bit. Let's say you're given a sequence of training examples. Remember that the perceptron algorithm works on the sequence. Let's say you have a sequence, I've just written x, m, y, m, but uh, you, you could think that this uh, sequence is infinite if you want. Every x, i is an n-dimensional vector. <coughs> Every y, i is minus one on one. And we make an assumption that all these points are the, the length, the distance of the point from the origin cannot be more than some number r. Now the way of, basically what this means is that there is this giant ball of radius r and all the points are contained inside. Okay? That's just the radius of the data. This is, and so, this is, suppose we are given these things. And now suppose this data is linearly separable by a unit vector u. <coughs> what this means is, just using the discussion that we saw before, there is some margin that is defined in this fashion. For every point xi and yi, so for every point xi, yi, it has to be farther away from than the margin. So you have uh, this line u, it's defined this way. You have this line u that's defined this way, and you have some point xi, and that has a label yi. And the distance of this from the hyperplane, this distance is given by yi times u transpose xi divided by norm of u. Right? Just the same thing that we saw before. But I assume it's a unit vector, so the norm of u is 1, so that disappears. <coughs> And I claim, because by definition of the margin, this distance has to be greater than the margin, because the margin is the closest distance. So this has to be greater than or equal to gamma. You write a better gamma. Okay? This is one way of defining the margin. So all I'm saying is there exists a unit vector that linearly separates the data with this margin. Then, the perceptron theorem says, the perceptron algorithm will make at most these many mistakes on the training set. 
it will make no more than r square over gamma square mistakes on this training set. So let me uh, walk you through some of the nuances and we'll see this multiple times so you can get used to it. First of all, this choice of r. If I said that you know the all the examples are contained in this ball of radius r. If I only have a finite number of examples, r is easy. All you have to do is find the farthest point. And by definition, all examples are closer to the origin than that point. So all you have to do is just go through the entire data set, find the farthest point. This uh, right here is uh, the definition of a margin. It simply says the data has a margin gamma. And more importantly, as uh, you pointed out earlier, the data is linearly separable. This is a formal way of stating that the data is linearly separable according to some weight vector u that has a norm 1. And uh, this is a complexity parameter that governs the difficulty of the data. If gamma is very small, that means that the points are very, very, the, pl the cl pluses and the minuses are very, very close to each other. If gamma is large, then the pluses and minuses are far away from each other. So intuitively, if the margin is large, then there's more room to find a weight vector. So if gamma is small, then maybe it will take more iterations. And that's what the theorem says. If gamma is small, the perceptron algorithm has to run for a longer time because the gamma is in the denominator. If the choice of a unit vector addresses the question that you had asked before, just to make the, uh, the maximum margin hyperplane unique. If it was not a unit vector, then this, <coughs> this number of mistakes would have been multiplied by the norm of u. Uh, let's not worry about it. It's an easy uh, addendum to the proof. So another way of just, if you want to translate this to English, uh, this theorem says, suppose you have a binary classification problem in n dimensions. If the data is linearly separable, then the perceptron algorithm will find a separating hyperplane after making a finite number of mistakes. And uh, this is basically the convergence theorem. Before uh, going into the proof, are there any questions about the statement of the theorem? Both the intuitive, you know, the blue version or the more formal version. And I'll leave this one on just so that I'm assuming this will trigger more questions. Yes? So you told the uh, gamma is distance between plus and minus. But sir, it is a distance between the hyperplane and the polynomial. Ah, good question. So <coughs> that, that, that's a good question. So let's say I have the pluses here and the minuses here. Okay? What is, let's step through a, a, a series of questions. Is this hyperplane the one that has the maximum margin? Okay, where should I move to? Towards the pluses or towards the minuses? Yes. Okay, so let me move towards the pluses. Towards the middle. Towards the middle. Okay, let's move towards the middle. It's equidistant, right? Yeah. So, in some sense, it has to be towards the middle, but it has to bisect. If I'm able to draw a circle around the pluses and a circle around the minuses, the hyperplane that has the maximum margin bisects that those two circles. And it goes like this. So this distance equals this distance. So if I was a better artist, I could have done something. <laughs> Let's just say this is correct. But you get my point. You are basically bisecting those two circles. Which means the, this margin is half the distance between the closest pluses and the minuses. The margin of the data set. Yes? It seems like there are several different slopes for that line, all of which would produce the largest margin. That's definitely true. In fact, <coughs> this was exactly the same question. I'm assuming that this line is, uh, has a unit, um, uh, the, this, let's call this W, or I'll call this U just to drive home the point. The, this U, the norm of U, equals 1. And then it uniquely determines, the, there's only one, if the data set is linearly separable, there's only one such IP. Um, now, if you turn it around, then you might end up getting a different uh, 
it will change the distances because then this might become closer. It, it, of course, it's possible that there can be multiple for a finite data set, but only one of them matters. There can be multiple with, you know, in this finite data set, you are sure I can probably find multiple with the same thing, but uh, only one of them is relevant. Other questions about the statement of this theorem? Otherwise, uh, I'm going to just jump into the proof, and that's not a threat. <laughs> so the, the assumption that U is a unit vector is what forces the uniqueness? <coughs> yes. All right. So let's go into the proof. And uh, to start off the proof, I want to I'm going to keep the update rule right here on top, just to remind you uh, what it is. Um, we check for the sign of the dot product in the true label, and if not, we make an update in this fashion. Um, our initial weight vector to make the proof easy, we we'll assume that the initial weights are all zero. Uh, to make our life simpler, we are going to assume that the learning rate is one. I encourage you to try out the same thing as an exercise uh, for a learn fixed learning rate. Uh, in fact, I, wa I want you to think about what happens when the learning rate is not one. We, the statement of the theorem gives us this uh, liberty to assume that all the, di the, the, the distance of any point from the origin is less than r, so the norm of xi we can assume is less than r, and by def again the statement of the theorem tells us that we are allowed to <coughs> use this gamma defined as a, uh, in this fashion. So we have a u, we have a gamma, we have an r, those are the things <coughs> that we have to juggle. To start off, this proof proceeds in three steps. I'm going to make, uh, have, prove two claims, and by claim I just mean lemma. But if you don't care for such words, just let's use claim. And the object, the, 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 the intuition behind this proof is that we are going to keep track of a certain property of the weight vector, and we keep track of it as we update the weights. And the property that we'll keep track is the dot product between the true weight, the u, and the object that we are moving, uh, the, the, the weights that the algorithm is learning. So we'll keep track of u and the, of the dot product between u and wt as t goes along. The first claim is as you, so first of all, if uh, just as a question to you guys, would you want this dot product to be large or small? Large. What hap What's the largest it can get? Assuming that if the same. if if u equals w, then the dot product becomes one. So, what we would like is as learning proceeds, these two dot the, the, the these two hyperplanes point in the same direction, which means they have the same. Uh, uh, the dot product is like a cosine, like, and so the cosine becomes large. So let's keep, it's a natural thing to want to keep track of this. The first lemma says that as t increases, this dot product keeps growing. And to prove that, let's just remember that w t plus one is w t plus u y i x i, and Taking the dot product of u with that is simply applying, you know, just expanding the, the, the applying definition. But what I know from definition of the margin is that yi w u transpose xi is greater than or equal to gamma, which means this plus anything that's positive or this plus anything will be greater than. Uh, let me just try to rephrase that. U transpose <coughs> WT plus 1 is equal to U transpose WT plus YI U transpose XI. But we know that YI U transpose XI is greater than gamma, so U transpose WT plus 1 is greater than or equal to U transpose WT plus gamma. So at any step, whenever we've made an update, we've at least added gamma to this dot product. Just algebra. Every little step in this proof is just algebra, but at the end you get this really non-intuitive result. Now, we assume that W0 is zero. At the beginning, we have a zero, which means that 
this is greater than or equal to u transpose w t minus <coughs> 1 plus 2 gamma and so on or w t minus 2 minus 3 gamma and so on but eventually we will get to u transpose w 0 plus t times gamma but u, w 0 is 0 so u transpose w 0 is also 0 and just by induction we can show that u transpose uh, the, the dot product between the weights and the uh, true uh, weight vector is greater than or equal to t gamma after t updates, after t mistakes. We haven't used the property that we've made a mistake here yet. We have not used the fact that this update only happens on a mistake, this update just by the mechanics of, just by the definition of this update we get this. Question. I feel like I've spoken more than necessary here because this is a fairly simple uh, algebraic, uh, very simple algebra. Why yes. are we trying to compare this with t gamma? Oh, we are not. This is just a, 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 this. You will see that in above. That will be step three. Step three will make that obvious. The second claim that I'm making is that any point, at any point, the norm of the weight vector is going to be restricted. The weights will not change by more than, at any point, the, the weights will get, in fact, as you go along, <coughs> as t increases, the norm of the weight vector keeps going down. And to prove that, all you have to do is just apply the definition of the update. After t plus 1 steps, the norm of the weight vector is simply the norm of the updated weight vector. But this is just a square, so I can expand the square, and I get the previous norm, plus twice this times this, and because they are dealing with vectors, the times becomes a dot, dot, dot product, times the norm of yi xi square, sorry, yeah, the norm of yi xy, times the square. But yi is just plus 1 or minus 1, so I can take it out, which is yi square times the norm of xi square. But yi can be plus 1 or minus 1, which means yi square is always 1. So this goes away, and you get just this term here. Now let's look at these three terms uh, in this summation. The first term, let's leave it as this. Now, finally, we'll use the fact that the weights get updated only when there's a mistake. What does it mean to be a mistake? Mistake means that yi wt transpose xi was less than 0. You made a mistake and then made an update, which means this quantity was less than 0 for the update to happen, which means this quantity here is less than 0. Right? And we also assume that all the points are contained in a unit ball, which means this quantity is less than or equal to r. Let's just say that this is less than or equal to 0. Okay? So, I have <coughs> two less than here, so I can just chain them all together, and I can say that, oh, so this quantity is less than r square. So, this is square here. xi is less than, norm of xi is less than r, norm of xi square is less than r square. So, let me chain them all together. wt square, wt plus 1 square is less than or equal to this term just carries over, you get the norm of wt square plus 0 plus r square. So that's what you get. So the norm of the weight vector after the update can be no more than the previous norm plus r square. <coughs> Will be less than the previous norm plus r square, but we know that the norm of the, the weights start off with 0, so w norm of w equals 0. So we can just apply induction again and we get what we want. Questions about this step? Yes? So where is the t coming from? t is the teeth mistake. No, I mean, in our math, we don't have a t. Oh, we don't have a t, but good question. Is that just an induction? That's from the induction. Let me actually uh, <coughs> prove it to you. So what we got out of one step 
is WT plus 1 square is nothing and equal to right? <coughs> but the same applies, in fact, you don't even have to think about it as induction. Let me just uh, prove it to you in a very straightforward way. This is, but the same applies for WT. Oh, no.
So r squared p is then equal to p dot p squared gamma squared and just putting the take, taking things around gives me p less than or equal to r squared. Questions about this book? I'll let you stare at it for a while. Um, And convince yourself that I have not cheated you in any way. <laughs> yes? So that's just the number of mistakes to find a W that will work. It's not necessarily going to keep going to the optimal. No, this, in fact, that's a good point. Nothing here says that eventually you'll hit U. In fact, if you stop making mistakes, W will never change. It doesn't matter whether you are at U or not. This the, the, the Poisson-Prawn algorithm need not find the best weight vector. It needs to find one that is good enough. Yes? So we are doing all this thing to prove that uh, it is, it should be, the number of mistakes should be n square like we did in online algorithm. Oh no, th this is an online algorithm. All, I'm doing all this to prove that the number of mistakes is bounded. And uh, if it is separable. If it is separable, yes. You should be, so I'm going to go ahead here uh, because I want you to go back and work out the proof for yourself. I'm a firm believer that you cannot learn math by looking at it on a whiteboard um, or on, on slides. You need to do it to kind of understand it. So please go ahead, go home and just reproduce this with the uh, slide because Convince yourself that every step is uh, legitimate. But let's go back to the theorem. So what we get here is a bound on the number of mistakes. So effectively what I have proved is this entire theorem. If you have a sequence of training examples where all examples are bounded in a unit in a ball of size r, and if the labels to these examples are such that the data is linearly separable by a unit vector with a margin gamma, then the perceptron algorithm will make no more than r square over gamma square mistakes. That's the theorem. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, this theorem never ceases to amaze me. Because, first of all, uh, there is somehow, first of the, the proof is kind of weird. By the way, this theorem is uh, called the Novikov theorem. Uh, the perceptron algorithm itself was invented in uh, 1958. Novikov and Bloch, two people independently proved this theorem. It's often called the Novikov theorem uh, for whatever, for historical reasons, but some people call it the Novikov Bloch theorem. Uh, more, more often than not, this is just called the Poseptron theorem. And before kind of appreciating the niceness of this result, I just want to uh, point out first of all, this, you know, the radius of the data is simply a property of the of the dimensionality. It's proportional to the dimensionality. In fact, you should, as an exercise, I want you to prove that for any Boolean functions with n attributes, r square equals n. What's the farthest you can get <coughs> with just zeros and ones if you have n of them? Now, what's the which point is the farthest from the origin? All of them one. So what's the distance of that point from the origin? Two, two. Two? N dimensions. If you have N ones. N. Yes. And that's R. So R square is N. So the number of mistakes for Boolean functions is uh, less than or equal to N over gamma square. Gamma itself is a property of the data. By data, I mean labeled data. And uh, in order to understand this uh, gamma and r, I have a series of exercises here and I strongly encourage you to uh, work them out. One of them may make it into a homework at some point. Uh, first of all, I want you to find out what is r and gamma for disjunctions. r is easy, which I just literally uh, talked about it now. r is r square is n. For a disjunction in n dimensions, what's gamma? I'm not going to tell you the answer now. Work it out. Start off with two dimensions. In order to find gamma, you need to find a hyperplane that maximally separates the data, and then you discover the gamma. 
Question. Uh, are we assuming that we have a data set that expands everything? Or Assume that you have a full data set. Assume you have the entire, all two power n boolean points. Okay. Yes. Um, you can now start asking the same question about specialized families of boolean functions that you know are linearly separable, like k disjunctions. We saw k disjunctions probably last week. And this is a tight bound, so I want you to find, you know, be adversarial to the perceptron algorithm. Find a series of examples that will force the perceptron algorithm to make the maximum number of mistakes. In this case, it's O of n, because r squared is n. So the number of mistakes is less than or equal to r squared over gamma squared, which means it's less than or equal to n over gamma squared, which is O of n. So try to find a series of examples, a sequence that will fool this uh, algorithm. And uh, to make your life easier, just consider maybe uh, two or three dimensional examples. But this is, so let's look at the, the implication of this theorem. First of all, this theorem says it does not matter what your sequence of examples is. If the data is linearly separable, even in the most adversarial case, it does not matter what the distribution of the examples is, it does not matter what the true concept is, as long as it's separable, the perceptron algorithm will find a separator. Even if an adversary is controlling the examples, the algorithm will find a separator, which is fairly non-intuitive. One might think that by carefully constructing a series of examples, you can fool this algorithm into not finding a separator, but no. The theorem says, after seeing these many mistakes, you don't have to worry because learning is done. Yes? We're, we're assuming that we actually do like go through all the examples. You, it's online learning. There's no fixed set of examples. You get an infinite, you get a possibly infinite stream of examples that keep coming. So say I'm adversarial and you giving it the same you made. Uh, you stop making mistakes. That one example, it's a mistake bound algorithm. If you keep giving it the same algorithm, you'll get good at it eventually. Okay. Sorry, if the same example, you'll get good at it eventually. That makes sense. Yes. But you don't even, have, you know, after making, a, so if, for example, I'm an adversary, and all I tell you is that this data is separable with a certain margin, and I'm going to try to fool you, you can, you know, you can, uh, let's say I tell you that this data is, uh, all, all the examples are in this ball of size r and there's a margin gamma and I'm going to try to fool you you can be rest assured if you're using the perceptron algorithm that after making r square over gamma square mistakes you are never ever going to make another mistake on this data no matter how adversarial I am and uh, this statement makes me vaguely Uneasy, but it is mathematical truth. Was there a question? Yes. What if the next data uh, test data increases r? Oh, I'm assuming that we know that all examples. Yes, we assume that all examples are inside this ball okay. forever. Yes. Uh, did we assume a learning rate in here? Was it the learning rate was one? Okay. Um, if you change the learning rate, in fact, try that out. Okay. Pick a learning rate r. See what happens to the theorem. That's the good news. If your data is linearly separable, the perceptron algorithm will find a linear separator. The bad news is that real life is not linearly separable. There are things like noise, there are things like nonlinear functions, and this is a very strong hypothesis class assumption that we are making. So, and there was an interesting question on the discussion board about what you can do if your data is not linearly separable. Often it ends up being things like you try to add more features, you try to introduce nonlinearity, and you hope it works. Sir? Yes. Whenever you say nonlinearity, does that mean changing from one dimension to another, like from 2 to 5? 2 to 5, 2 to 4. It, does, it could be taking, uh, taking the feature x and converting it into x square. All right. For example. Can it go in the same dimension also from x1 to another? Yeah, yeah, any transformation. It could be x to 
uh, sin x to nonlinearity. Yes? And for uh, not separable data, you add more features just because of, uh, just because of the fact that the higher dimensional uh, spaces tend to be more linearly separable? That's one. But if you randomly add features, you are in, 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 let's take this theorem here. If you add arbitrary features, you are effectively increasing R. So you are making the, the data might be more separable. Well, easy, there's more, it's more likely that the data is linearly separable, but you are also making it harder to find the separator. Uh, which is why it, uh, that actually motivates the next algorithm we'll see. We need, it's better if we add relevant features. If you know something about the data, you should somehow inject it into the learning. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, the perceptron algorithm as is, is prone to overfitting and there are ways of avoiding that. In fact, that will be the first variant of the algorithm that we will see. So, yes? We don't know we don't know gamma beforehand, we don't know the number of mistakes that you make beforehand. So, yeah. so it's an entirely theoretical construction. All we know is if the data is linearly separable, there are a finite number of mistakes, but we don't know. If we knew gamma beforehand, we already have u. And if you have u, why are you learning? <laughs> and how do we know the data is linearly separable? We don't. We don't. It's an it's a assumption that you make in order to prove the theorem. If the data is linearly separable, then the perceptron will find it. Now, whether the data is linearly separable or not is uh, a different question. <clears throat> so, what you need to know from this section is you need to know what's the perceptron mistake bound. You need to be aware of the perceptron cycling theorem. You need to be able to prove the perceptron mistake bound, um, and, it's, uh, and uh, understand what the bound means. Okay, let's move ahead. Uh, we have five minutes. I'll probably introduce one of the variants of perceptron and uh, pick up from that in the next class. In practice, the perceptron algorithm is used quite widely, but in practice, we also don't have the luxury of an infinite stream of examples most of the time. So we are limited to finite number of examples, like what you have in your homework. And so, one of the variants of the perceptron algorithm is. Uh, taking this online algorithm and converting it into what's called a batch algorithm. You have a batch of examples and you want to find the best weight vector according to this batch. And that will be the first variant that we'll see. Uh, then there was a question of overfitting that came up and the perceptron tends to overfit and the answer to avoid overfitting is called voting. And voting is uh, a nice idea in theory but in practice it doesn't, it doesn't scale. So an approximation of that is called averaging, which is actually the algorithm that you need to use. Uh, anytime you use perceptron in the wild, you will be using averaged perceptron and uh, in the setting that uh, I will describe in a minute in the, the, with a limited number of examples. And you will see another variant called the margin perceptron, which plays with this idea of, of called margin to make more aggressive updates. So, the standard version of the perceptron algorithm, not the online one, but the standard version of the perceptron algorithm does not look like this online game, but actually has something, uh, uh, has this shape. You're given a training set, and there are only a, there is only this training set. You don't have the luxury of asking for more examples. All examples are n-dimensional vectors, and the labels are minus one and one. And the standard algorithm, what you do is, you initialize the weights to zero, and you have multiple epochs. In each epoch, what you do is you first shuffle the data, and then within this, after shuffling the data, you just run the perceptron updates over the training set. This red box that I just drew is just the perceptron algorithm. You pick an example, make a prediction. If there's a mistake, you make an update. All you're doing is repeating this multiple times over the training set again and again, but before starting, you need to shuffle the data. In fact, you need to shuffle the data because otherwise this uh, uh, may not work as well. This is, and at the end of t epochs, after, after a certain number of epochs, you return the weight and then learning is done. 
you no longer update the weights and then you sell your classifier that makes predictions the usual way. What do you mean by shuffle the data? You have a list of examples, you just shuffle the list. Permutation. Permute. Yes, randomly permute. It's not fixed permutation, you randomly permute. So for each, uh, you know, the, for each epoch T, we're shuffling the entire data set yes. and running the entire data set? Yes. Okay. That's right. So changing the order? Changing the order? The weights? Changing the order introduces some notion of uh, robustness to the update. Uh, in fact, as an exercise, what you could try is since you guys are implementing, I, maybe I will, I'm even making you do this in the yeah. uh, homework, mm -hmm. try it without and with shuffling. In general, uh, changing the order of examples randomly helps. And if the, to ask, to, to think about why that helps, this uh, will, I'll answer the why part later because this has interesting connections with stochastic gradient descent. Remember stochastic gradient descent that we saw a few weeks back? This actually is a stochastic gradient descent algorithm. Yes? Do we actually have to do it randomly or could we find some sufficiently complex way that it's not actually random? You know, random is easier. Well, yeah, but actually, for the, I get that, but I was just curious. For the, the theory to work, you need random. Okay. Uh, in fact, kind of. I mean, this is a, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to make the statement that this is a formal proof, but in, a variant of this requires randomness. Okay. The stochastic part of the stochastic gradient descent requires randomness. How do you decide which W to choose then for module? Oh, you, this is at every step you update, right? You return the last W. Yeah. So this W, you initialize the W, and the W that comes out at the end of this box is the one that goes back in here. So you maintain a W and you it uh, you keep updating it over the epochs. So now we've introduced a new hyperparameter in addition to the learning rate, which was always there, you have now T, the number of epochs that you run. And how do you pick T? The answer is cross-validation. You try 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 200, 2000, whatever, and you pick that number by cross-validation. Um, this is just to remind you that you can write error as y of it after x i and uh, r is of course the learning rate. So you have two hyperparameters now, t and r, and you have to pick them both using cross-validation. And empirically what happens is if you let t go to infinity, this ends up overfitting the data. So as you run t to infinity, and typically if you look at the error of the classifier, as learning proceeds, as t increases, you start off by, or let's look at accuracy, you start off by making, having low accuracy, learning goes on, and this is called the learning curve. It gets better and better, and as t increases, sometimes you even drop. So it can even be something like this. So the goal of cross-validation is to find the sweet spot. All right, I'll stop right now. Um, and we'll continue in the next lecture with variants of perceptron and hopefully we'll get to another online algorithm called the Winnow. And reminders, uh, you have a homework that's due next week, so if you haven't started, please do. Uh,